begin with prayer. Lord, we just thank you that you're never going to let us down. How true that is. You never, never let us down. You'll never leave us. You'll never forsake us. And Lord, we see this truth as we go through the book of Psalms. We find ourselves here in the Psalms as the psalmists are writing the various uh, things that they're struggling with and going through and ultimately worshiping you. And Lord, we want to do that tonight. Just as we come to your word, as we open up, we pray we would be worshiping you for who you are. So bless this time in your word. We pray this in Jesus name. We all agree saying amen. Amen. This week I read um, about the English poet William Blake, and he was looking at the sunrise with a London merchant. And the poet asked the merchant, what do you see? The merchant said, well, I see a beautiful sunrise. And then he asked, well, what do you see? The poet replied, I see a host of angels and they're crying, holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, heaven and earth are filled with your glory. And I, I thought, wow, what a contrast, right? You see, the first man was just an observer. I see a sunrise. The other man was a worshiper. Wow, what I see, God's majesty, you know. And this is really what we find as we delve into the book of Psalms. You have 150 Psalms written by godly believers who spend time in God's presence. And as they write, led of the Holy Spirit, they lead us into deeper worship with God. In fact, we noted last time as we began this book that all of these Psalms were set to music. And over time, uh, they became really the temple hymn book as they would sing these Psalms. So it's just exciting as we grow in our walk with the Lord. And again, we find ourselves so readily and easily in the Psalms as we go through them. So we're going to be going at a fairly fast clip because we, we want to get out of here in about six months. So, so if you don't mind. And so I've entitled these verses we're looking are these chapters, How Excellent Is Your Name? That's what we see even as we begin in Psalm 8. To the chief musician on the instrument of Gath. Isn't that interesting? We'll note that. A psalm of David. What's interesting is Gath, of course, was a Philistine city. It was the hometown of Goliath. And so we believe that David wrote this after his victory over Goliath. And the thrust is just the excellence of God. O Lord, our Lord, how excellent is your name in all of the earth. So, Lord, your name is highly regarded. And, you know, that's so true, isn't it? And yet that's only true of believers. I was looking at statistics. 1.8 billion Muslims exalt Allah. A half billion Buddhists exalt Buddha. 1.2 billion Hindus bow to various gods. And then you add in there all kinds of other gods and atheists and agnostics. But only those who have come to know the true God. Say, oh, Lord, our Lord, how excellent is your name? Because he's the only true God. And so here's David proclaiming it. He says, you who have set your glory above the heavens. So not only is God's glory seen in his creation on earth, it's also in the heavens. Out of the mouth of babes and nursing infants, you have ordained strength because of your enemies that you may silence the enemy and the avenger. Now, as human beings, we tend to look for strength in numbers or strength in those who look physically opposing, right? As was Goliath compared to David, who wrote this in the aftermath of his demise. But God can bring strength through a ruddy teenager in face of a, di a giant, or even as David says, through nursing infants. I mean, think about this. The strength of Egypt. Think of their mighty power and the many nations they subdued. Well, God, in order to bring them to their knees, brought a little, little baby boy into the, you know, the palace. And he became the prince of Egypt. And soon he would be the deliverer, Moses. Out of babes. When I consider your heavens, your work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you've ordained, what is man that you're mindful of him? So think of David just prior to going and slaying Goliath. He had left his father's fields. He was a shepherd. And being a shepherd there in the evenings, just observing the stars and seeing God's creation. Isn't it wonderful? Isn't it great when you get out to the country and just see the beauty of God's creation? And notice he says, the work of your fingers. Obviously, we usually, when we think of strength, we strength the, the hand or the arm of God. 
But, you know, it's nothing. Just even the fingers create all of that majesty. And God creates it all. And yet what boggles David is that with all of that, why are you mindful of man? What is the son of man that you visit him? Lord, I can't, I can't even believe that you, you take care of me, that you even think of me. The Bible says in Romans 7, 18, that in our flesh dwells no good thing. And yet God in his awesome wonder, you know, concerns himself with us. That blows us away. It blew David away, right? I think of Jeremiah 29, 11. This is God. He says, I know the thoughts that I think towards you, says the Lord. Thoughts of peace, not of evil, to give you a future and a hope. That's what God thinks about you and about me. And then David adds, for you have made him, that's man, a little lower than the angels. And you've crowned him with glory and honor. Isn't it interesting that he says, he doesn't say man is made a little higher than the beasts. No, he says, we're made just a little lower than the angels. Charles Darwin described man as the most efficient animal on the earth. What a degrading view. I am not an efficient animal. I am a man in, or man or woman made in the image of God. Amen. And he says, of man, you made him to have dominion over the works of your hands. You put all things under his feet, all sheep, oxen, beasts of the field, birds of the air, fish of the sea that pass through the paths of the seas. So God has given man dominion over the earth. I'm not, this is not animal planet. Okay, this is not animal planet. This is man's planet given by God as a gift to have dominion. That's awesome. And David was blown away by that. And so he ends like he begins. Oh, Lord, our Lord, how excellent is your name in all the earth. Psalm 9, to the chief musician, to the tune of Death of the Son, a psalm of David. And with this preface, many believe, and even the rabbis inscribed in their commentaries, that David wrote this after his son with Bathsheba had died. Very difficult time in the life of David. You could read the story in 2 Samuel 12. He fasted and prayed, Lord, spare his life. And, and then, of course, God did not allow that to happen. Yet in the wake of that, David still kept his eyes on the Lord. And so in the wake of that, losing his son, he writes, I will praise you, O Lord, with my whole heart. I will tell of all of your marvelous works. Isn't that great? When your perspective is right as a believer, you can lose something so precious and dear to you, and still it doesn't throw you off. I see people lose things in their life, and they just can't ever get over it. Well, their perspective is wrong. Their, their perspective isn't on the Lord. What a huge difference it makes when we have God as the, this, the compass of our life, the foundation of our life. And notice he says, I'll praise you with my whole heart. You know, sometimes we're guilty of praising God with a half heart, half-heartedly, right? But God wants our whole heart. So in that spirit, David says, I'll be glad. Imagine that. I'll be glad. And this is key. I will glad and rejoice in you. I will sing praise to your name, O Most High. Now, I think that's really key. I will rejoice in you. You see, I can't always rejoice in my circumstances, but I can always rejoice in the Lord in that circumstance. This is very similar to Philippians 4.4, 4, where Paul says, rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say rejoice. The key is rejoicing in the Lord. I, I, I'm not rejoicing in the fact that maybe someone who's a good friend of mine has lost their job. I'm not rejoicing in the fact that maybe a good friend of mine has lost someone dear to them. But I can rejoice in the Lord in that circumstance. I can say, Lord, I'm going to rejoice in you because you have a plan in this. There's a purpose that you're allowing this. So I never have to lose my joy no matter what. It's all working together for the good, right? Romans 8, 28. So David says, I'll be glad and rejoice in you. I'll sing to your name, O Lord Most High. Now, moving on, he talks about God's power over his enemies as a reminder that God can do anything. He says, when my enemies turn back, they shall fall and perish at your presence. For you have maintained my right and my cause. In other words, you're my protector and my sustainer. You sat on the throne judging it righteously or in righteousness. You have rebuked the nations. You have destroyed the wicked. You have blotted out their name forever and ever. Oh, enemy, destructions are finished forever. 
And you have destroyed cities. Even their memory has perished. But the Lord shall endure forever. He has prepared his throne for judgment. He shall judge the world in righteousness. And he shall administer judgment for the people in uprightness. So what he's saying is, God, you have fully sustained me even in my difficulty, even in the times of my enemies, and you will judge not just this matter, but all matters, the whole world, in righteousness. The Lord, verse 9, will be a refuge for the oppressed, a refuge in time of trouble. Now notice he's speaking about this in past tense. He, he's a refuge in time of troubles and would be. Yes, that's true. And that is what God is for us, not only in the past, but in the present. And I think of Psalm 46, 1. God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in time of need. And because of that, verse 10, those who know your name will put their trust in you. For you, Lord, have not forsaken those who seek you. So God is faithful always to sustain his people, whether it is in the psalm before dealing with uh, Goliath or is it in this psalm where he lost his son. The Lord sustains his people. In Proverbs 18.10, it likens God to a strong tower. The Lord is a strong tower, it says, and the righteous run to it and are safe. There's safety in the arms of the Lord. And so David urges us to worship him. Sing praises to the Lord who dwells in Zion. Declare his deeds of the, among the people. Let's worship him and tell others to trust him. When he avenges blood, he remembers them. He does not forget the cry of the humble. And so have mercy on me, O Lord. Consider my trouble from those who hate me. You who lift me up from the gates of death, that I may tell of your praise in the gates of the daughter of Zion, I will rejoice in your salvation. And then he addresses or speaks of the wicked, beginning in verse 15. The nations have sunk down into the pit which they made, in the net which they hid. Their own foot is caught. The Lord is known by the judgment he executes. The wicked is snared in the work of his own hands. Meditation, Selah, which is kind of nice. It's actually telling us that's an interpretation of what Selah means. Remember, we talked about that and we'll see it a lot. It means to stop and contemplate on that. In other words, contemplate the fact that the wicked will be ultimately judged. He adds in verse 17, the wicked shall be turned into hell and all the nations that forget God. However, on the flip side of that verse 18, the needy shall not always be forgotten. The expectation of the poor shall not perish forever. In other words, he'll take care of those that come to him, those that are broken, those that are needy who come to the Lord. He will take care of them. And so he concludes, arise, O Lord. Do not let man prevail. Let the nations be judged in your sight. Put them in fear, O Lord, that the nations may know themselves to be but men. What a great truth to contemplate. You know, we, we just need to realize, what can man do? You know, here we are in an election year. What am I saying? We're in an election month almost, right? I mean, elections are when people are freaking out. What are we going to do? What if this person becomes president? What if that person becomes president? What about, what about it? Does that shake you? Does that concern you? Are you worried? Are you fearful? I'm not. Because God is in control, Right? I mean, that, he, he says, let the nations know that they themselves are but men. They're but men. God is in control. We trust in God. Our confidence is in him. Now, chapter 10, or Psalm 10, the writer, and this is so good, wrestles with the apparent prosperity of the wicked. And in doing so, we have this profile of the wicked. Now, in the end, there's a proclamation, of course, God is always in control. But the psalmist begins, why do you stand afar off, O Lord? Why do you hide in times of trouble? The wicked in his pride persecutes the poor. Let them be caught in the plots which they devise. In other words, Lord, the, it seems like the wicked are getting away with it. Why don't you do something about it? Don't you see these injustices? Children are being put to death. Same-sex marriage, it seems, is, is putting over even marriage. What, what's going on in our country? And the wicked seem to be commended for these unrighteous acts. Not only that, the wicked in his pride persecutes the poor. Seems like the wicked are putting down the needy. For the wicked boasts of his heart's desire. He blesses the greedy and renounces the Lord. You know, making, I mean, mocking God. 
The wicked in his proud countenance does not seek God. God is not even in his thoughts. His ways are always prospering, though. Your judgments are far above, out of his sight. As for all of his enemies, he sneers at them. So God doesn't seem like you're doing anything. He's away from your judgment. And he has said in his heart, well, I shall not be moved. I shall never be in adversity. Everything's going to go good for me. And his mouth is full of cursing and deceit and oppression. Under his tongue is trouble and iniquity. Wow. Sometimes we, we see that. We go, why does it seem like the whisk, wicked prosper? It seems like he's getting away with it. Verse 8. He sits in the lurking places of the villages. In the secret places, he murders the innocent. His eyes are secretly fixed on the helpless. He lies in wait secretly as a lion in his den. He lies in wait to catch the poor. He catches the poor, then he draws them into his net. So he crouches, he lies low, that the helpless may fall by his strength. And he has said in his heart, God has forgotten. God doesn't see, God doesn't even care about me. And he hides his face and, he, and God will never see me. So all of these injustices, right? Therefore, David says in verse 12, Arise, O Lord, O God, lift up your hand. Do not forget the humble. Why do the wicked renounce God? He has said in his heart, You'll not require an account. Now, that's not true. In fact, Hebrews 4.13 tells us that all men are naked and open before the eyes of him whom we will give an account. And so that said, the, the, the psalmist moves from this profile of the wicked to the proclamation of God's faithfulness. Because he then says, but you have seen. But Lord, not true. You have seen. You observe trouble and grief to repay it by your hand. The helpless commits himself to you, and you are the helper of the fatherless. So God ultimately does see, he will judge, and he rewards the godly. And so the psalmist continues, break the arm then of the wicked and the evil man. Seek out his wickedness until you find none. The Lord is king forever and ever. The nations have perished out of his land. Lord, you have heard the desire of the humble. You will prepare their heart. You will cause your ear to hear, to do justice to the fatherless and the oppressed, that the man of the earth may oppress no more. And so God is faithful. You will take care of the wicked and you will do it in your timing. And really what you have here is this declaration of faithfulness. When I was um, young, my parents, you know, they, they took my, my sister and I. We went to most of the states in the United States. We traveled all, uh, everywhere. Went to all the national parks. I remember going to Yellowstone National Park several times. And, you know, the geysers all over. It's kind of cool. And, you know, there's that famous one, Old Faithful. Yep, I sat there and watched Old Faithful, you know, kind of like, it's going to go off pretty soon. And that little thing, a little thing that they had as a timer, you know. But over the years, it's interesting. I was reading that its eruption lengths and its intervals have changed a little bit. Its name has not changed, Old Faithful, but in fact, its behavior has. And I have found that, you know, sometimes we as believers are kind of like that. We're kind of like old faithful. Our behavior isn't really always that faithful. <laughs> you know, it changes, right? But God's, listen, but God's nature never changes. God says, I'm immutable, which is a fancy word of saying, I change not. And what the psalmist is ending here is by saying, the wicked may appear to get, uh, get away with it, but God is Faithful, He will reward the righteous and he will deal with the wicked. Now we come to Psalm 11 to the chief musician, another Psalm of David. And we believe that this Psalm most concur that it was written somewhere during the time when David was on the run from Saul, which, by the way, was a 10 year period. And it's during this time that David writes in you, I put my trust, Lord. How can you say to my soul, flee as a bird to your mountain? In other words, you know, I, I, he, he's on the run all the time from Saul. For look, the wicked bend their bow. They make ready their arrow on the string that they may shoot secretly at the upright in heart. And, and so David was constantly on the flee from Saul. And this is, notice what he says. If the foundations are destroyed, what can the righteous do? And, and what he is referring to is that the foundation of the nation was beginning to crumble because the very first king that they had 
was an unspiritual man. He was an ungodly man. And he's saying, if the foundations are destroyed, what, what can we possibly do? Well, God can slowly but surely raise up a shepherd boy and eventually make him the next king, you know, which is exactly what God did through David. But it was a period of time that God was, you know, forging David to make him that next king. And the Lord, he says, is in his holy temple. Now, here, he's not referring to the temple itself. He can't be because the temple of Solomon isn't even built yet. His son would build it. So notice he says the Lord's throne is in heaven. And what he's saying is God is there in heaven. We're worried about, and he was a little worried himself. He's on run from Saul. But he's, he's reminding himself, wait a second, God is still on the throne in heaven. He sees everything. God's not anxious. He's not concerned. He knows what he's doing. His eyes behold. His eyelids test the sons of men. So I don't need to worry is what he's saying. C.H. Spurgeon wrote many years ago, what plots can men devise which the Lord will not discover? Satan has doubtless desired to have us that he may sift us as wheat, but the Lord is in the temple praying for us. And how can then our faith fail? End quote. In other words, God, God knows. He's in control. But again, this word in verse three, if the foundations are destroyed, what can the righteous do? I, I was reading that much today and I thought, well, as I look at the foundations of our nation, the Christian heritage that we have, wow, the foundations don't look too good, do they? They really have crumbled. And uh, so what do we do? Well, we have to put our trust in the Lord is what we have to do. We have to trust in him. We have to realize he's still on the throne. He's in control. And we leave it with him. We trust him. We pray. We seek him. We, of course, pray for the best. We owe to have revival in our nation again, right? But notice verse 5, the Lord tests the righteous, but the wicked and the one who loves violence, his soul hates. Upon the wicked, he will rain coals, fire and brimstone and burning wind shall be the portion of their cup. So God will ultimately see the atrocities and he will deal righteously. Why? Verse 7, for the Lord is righteous. He loves righteousness. His countenance beholds the upright. So God is constantly concerned and he knows about the righteous. I love the fact that his countenance beholds the righteous. In other words, you know, it's God's face is looking down to literally not only look upon his people, but to bless them. You know, we're familiar with the, the priest's blessing. In the book of Numbers, chapter 6 and verse 24, of course, it's become a little more popular recently because someone used the very scriptures to write a song about it. But, you know, the Lord bless you. God said, this is what I want my priests to do to the people on a regular basis. You stand over the people when they gather and you say, the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and look upon you and give you his peace. And, and that's really what he's saying. The Lord loves the righteous. Countenance beholds the upright and he's seeking to bless his people and he will. And ultimately, you know, if we don't see it in our lifetime, when we die, we'll be with the Lord and we'll be in his presence anyway. It's all good. Now, Psalm 12, to the chief musician on an eight-string harp, another psalm of David. Help, Lord. By the way, that's a good way to begin a psalm, isn't it? That's a good way to begin any prayer. Help, Lord. If you can only get those two words out, that's a good way to start. Help, Lord, for the godly man ceases, for the faithful disappear from among the sons of men. So now this is a cry for godly men. And again, I'm not discounting godly women. because There's a lot of great godly women. But here he's calling out for godly men. Proverbs 20 and verse 6 says, A faithful man who can find. It's difficult. It is difficult. In fact, Hezek, or Ezekiel, I should say, in Ezekiel 22, 30, he writes, God speaking through the prophet says, I sought for a man among those who would stand in the gap for me on behalf of the land that I should not destroy it, but I found none. Think about that. That's what David is experiencing here. He says, 
help, Lord. The faithful man has disappeared. Ezekiel spoke of it. And I think that this is something that we need today. And I will say this, truly, I thank God for the godly men we have in our church. Really, truly. I thank God for our pastors. I thank God for the men on our staff. I thank God for our deacons. I thank God for our leadership. There are so many good and godly men here tonight. And, and I'm just so thankful for that. This is what our nation needs. So David then describes those in the world. Now, those in the world speak idly, everyone with his neighbor, with flattering lips and double heart they speak. In other words, they just flatter and they gossip and everything with their mouth. But the Lord will cut off all their flattering lips and the tongue that speaks proud things. You know, we need to be careful how we use our tongue, right? Uh, James chapter 3 t says it's a, it's a member that boasts great things. And, and then he goes on and says, every animal has been tamed. Every creature and every reptile has been tamed by man, but no one can tame the tongue. You're right. We can't, but God can under the power of the Holy Spirit. And David adds in verse 4, who have said with our tongue, we will purvey our lips are our own. Who is Lord over us? Well, that's not good, right? That's boastful. For the oppression of the poor, for the sighing of the needy. Now I will rise, says the Lord, and I will set him in safety for which he yearns. So in the midst of ungodliness, we can trust the Lord. He will take care of us. I think of God's great word to the children of Israel during their time of Egyptian oppression. In Exodus 3, 7, God said this, Surely... I have seen the oppression of my people and I've heard their cry. So God says, I see what's going on. I hear what's going on. I hear their cries. And he came and he delivered them. God sees what we go through, the oppression. God hears our cries and he will, he will answer in his perfect timing. Now, the psalmist adds, the words of the Lord are pure words, like silver tried in a furnace of earth, purified seven times. So we know that silver is purified by heating it up so it becomes molten. And then the impurities or the alloy rises to the top and you scrape it off. And, and he's talking about it's, you know, seven times being done. So it's so pure, you know. And that's, of course, God's word. God's word is pure. And God's way is perfect. And so David says in verse 7, You shall keep them, O Lord. You shall preserve them from this generation forever. Now, the wicked prowl on every side when vileness is exalted among the sons of men. But again, we can trust in God. Though the wicked will remain and continue until the end of the age, God is with his people. Chapter, or Psalm 13, to the chief musician, again, another Psalm of David. How long, O Lord? Will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? So this psalm begins with discouragement. And we believe this psalm, like Psalm 11, was written again during that long period of time, 10 years, while David was on the run from Saul. Now, think about that, 10 years. How long have we been dealing with coronavirus? Not even a year. We're thinking, man, this is forever. Okay, David was running for his life 10 years. To make matters more difficult or challenging, just prior to that, Samuel the prophet comes up and anoints him and says, dude, you're going to be the next king. All right. And I'm thinking year one, year two, uh, Lord, when are you going to do this thing? When, 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 right? So now we understand, it says, how long, O oh Lord? Will you forget me forever? Have you, have you forgotten what you said you were going to do? You, well, how long are you going to hide your face from me? So, again, we understand a little bit of how David feels, right? He feels forgotten. Have you ever felt forgotten? Yeah. God, you told me. I thought you were going to take care of all my bills. I thought I was going to be this by this time, you know. God says, no, I have a totally different plan for you. You're going over here. What? You know, and we just wonder, what are you doing, God? God always has a plan. How long shall you take counsel in my soul, having sorrow in my heart daily? How long will my enemy be exalted over me? Again, Saul was con constantly dogging David's steps. Consider and hear me, O Lord my God. Enlighten my eyes, lest I sleep the sleep of death. David's saying, if this goes on any longer, I'm going to die. Actually, on several occasions, David, I mean, Saul got so close to taking David's life. One time he was on the other side of the mountain, remember, and he just got away from him. One time Saul even came into the same cave that David was in. 
Of course, David had an opportunity to take his life, and he didn't. But he was constantly fearful. If I go any longer, I'm going to die. Verse 4, lest my enemies say, I've prevailed against them, lest those who trouble me rejoice when I'm not removed. So, Lord, would you give me deliverance, lest the enemies say, yeah, David's really, he was an anointed of God, you know. Now, notice the last part of this psalm, though. There's a big change. There's a swing of emotion. David begins kind of strut, how long, how long? But then he stops himself halfway through, and I love this about the psalms, because it's true in our lives. We kind of get down and everything, and all of a sudden we come to our senses, you know. And he say, ah, oh, I've trusted in your mercy. Therefore, my heart shall rejoice in your salvation. Lord, what am I, why am I complaining? Why am I worried about, I, I've been saved by you, you see. So he could rejoice in God's salvation. We can do the same thing. We can be discouraged about a situation. How come this? How come that? But it's like, wait a second. I, I've been born again. You've given me new life. Why, why am I distraught? I mean, one day I'm going to be in the house of the Lord forever. Isn't that Psalm 23? Yeah. Actually, we'll see that next week, right? Yea, though I walk through the valley of shadow of death, I fear no evil. You rod and your staff are with me, right? But I'm walking through the valley of the shadow of death, right? And sometimes it's, but I don't have to worry because what? I'm going to dwell in the house of the Lord forever. So, okay, all right. So thank you for my salvation. In fact, he says, I'll sing to the Lord because he has dealt, check this out, bountifully with me. Isn't that great? I mean, he starts off with sorrow. How long? And then it's like, God, you've been so good. You have bountifully blessed me, which is quite a statement since the fact is he doesn't have much more than the clothes on his back and the weapons in his hand at this time. But he realized God had, has sustained me. He sustained me over Goliath. He sustained me over uh, being on the run from Saul. So good. C.H. Spurgeon wrote this. Whenever you look into David's Psalms, you may somewhere or another see yourself. You never get into a corner, but find that David's been in that corner. I think that I've never been so low, but then I find that David was lower. And I've never climbed so high that I found out that David had been above me ready to sing a song upon a stringed instrument, even as I could sing mine. Yeah. Amen. I think I, that's what I love about the Psalms. They're so identifiable. I've, I've had that feeling. And then I've come to that place. Wait a second. You're so good. I'm going to be with you, God, forever. Okay. It's all right. It's all right. God is good. Psalm 14. Now we're going to look at two more. We'll end with Psalm 15. So we're going to get two more in here. To the chief musician, a Psalm of David. The fool has said in his heart, there is no God. They're corrupt. They've done abominable works. There's none who does good. I mean, really, it's only a fool who says there's no God because God is everywhere. Psalm 19.1 says, and we'll see this next week, the heavens declare the glory of the Lord. The firmament, everything shows his handiwork. So creation itself speaks of a designer. Beyond that, Romans 2, 14 tells us that God has put his law in our hearts so that we know right from wrong. So we have the witness of creation. We have, we have the witness of God's law written on our hearts. So how foolish is it then to reject those things and say, I don't want to know God. So David writes, the Lord looks down from heaven upon the children of men to see if there are any who understand and seek God. 2 Chronicles 2.16 says, The eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the entire earth to show himself strong on those who are loyal to him, who are looking for him, who are seeking him. However, those who reject God, verse 3, they've all turned aside, they've together become corrupt, and there is none who does good, no, not one. Now that might sound familiar to you because that's requoted in Romans 3.10. A proof that we all are born into sin. There is none who does good. Well, yes, there is. No, not one. It's almost like put in there twice just in case you want to rebuttal it, you know. <laughs> Romans 3.23 says we all sin. We all come short of the glory of God. And so we cannot get ourselves into heaven no matter what we do, right? Romans 3.20 says by the deeds of the law, no flesh will be justified before God. Well, I do this and I do that. Well, that's not going to get you into heaven. Why? Because it ain't good enough. There's no good, good enough. And the Bible says twice, and there's none who does good. No, not one. Huh, then what am I to do? Exactly. That's the whole point. Now you come to Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. For by grace, then, you're saved through faith. 
that none of yourselves. It's not of works, lest I would boast. Oh, thank the Lord, right? Now, have all the workers of iniquity no knowledge? In other words, is sinful man excused for his actions because he doesn't have any knowledge of God? Who eat up my people as they eat bread and do not call on the Lord? And the answer is no. Let me, let me read to you Romans 1, 19 and 20. Because what may be known of God is manifest in them. Again, and later on he talks about God's law in our hearts. And since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes are clearly seen and understood by the things that are made. Therefore, he says, man is without excuse. Man is without excuse to reject God because he has put it in his creation and he has put it in man's heart. Now, turning the corner, David talks about the righteous, those who do come to God. They are in great fear, which means holy respect. For God is with the generation of the righteous. You shame the counsel of the poor, but the Lord is his refuge. So man puts down the disregarded, but God takes care of them. Oh, that the salvation of Israel would come to Zion. Oh, that everyone would be saved, is what he's saying. When the Lord brings back captivity of his people, let Jacob rejoice and Israel be glad. And then just one footnote on that last verse. Many suggest that might even be a reference. This might be a messianic in the fact that it's referring to that time where Christ comes and he sets up his kingdom on earth to deliver mankind, quite possibly. Now, the last psalm we look at, Psalm 15. Again, another psalm of David. Lord, who may abide in your tabernacle? Who may dwell in your holy hill? Now, again, the temple had not been built yet. David, perhaps referring to the tabernacle, which, by the way, had been relocated from Shiloh and then for the very first time placed. So the tabernacle itself started with Moses, brought to Shiloh. Then David put it in Jerusalem. And it was there, of course, that God manifested his presence, right? Of course, only the high priest could go in behind the holiest of holies once a year to atone for the sins people. So David's saying, well, well, then who can come into your presence? Who, who can approach you? And you think he'd respond, well, just the high priest. No, 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 I'm not bound there. Even, even an Old Testament saint like David understood. No, I could be in your presence. Who? He walks uprightly. He who works righteousness. He who speaks the truth in his heart. Now, David is not talking about the perfect man because no one is perfect. But God is looking for the upright when we walk before him. God had said to Satan, have you behold my servant Job upright and blameless? He was a man who loved the Lord. And he was also a man, as David says, who has righteous works. Now, we just said that we're not saved by works. Absolutely. Right? You know, we're not saved by what we do, but a person who's saved does. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? There's works that come out. How about this? Ephesians 2.10, right after it says, for by grace you're saved through faith, not, not of yourselves, not of works, lest any man would boast. And then it says this in verse 10, for we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works. So the idea is that God created us to worship him. And when I worship him and put him first, I do things that please him, not to get saved, not because I have to, but because I want to. So there will be righteous works. And then it says he will speak the truth in his heart. There's a sincerity there. So who can approach the Lord? He who is upright in his walk, has righteous works, and has a truthful heart. He who does not, now he tells us what we don't do if we love the Lord. He who does not backbite with his tongue. What the Bible calls a gossiper, a backbite, a talebearer, a, a divisive person. And so if I'm a believer, if I'm a Christian, I don't do that. In fact, I reject people that do. Titus 3.10 says, reject a divisive person. Nor does evil to his neighbor. I don't do evil things to my neighbor. I don't speak behind his back or anything like that. I love on him. Nor does he take up a reproach against a friend in whose eyes a vile person is despised. Of course not. Rather, he honors those who fear the Lord. I, I'm going to hang out with those that love Jesus, Right? He who swears to his own hurt and does not change. In other words, I'm, I'm seeking the best of others. Or as Philippians 2, 4 says, esteeming others better than myself. He who does not put out his money at usury. In other words, I don't use money for corrupt purposes. Nor take a bribe against the innocent. 
He who does these things shall never be moved. Now, that's a very short psalm, isn't it? But who is God looking for? Now, is God looking for perfect people? No, because then none of us qualify, right? So we can't get saved by our good deeds. But here's the other thing. God realizes that we're not going to do things perfect. Then what is God looking for? Your heart. He sees your heart. He knows your sincerity. He knows your honesty. And so here, David is really getting at the heart. And David, you know, wanted to know God, didn't he? Yeah. He wanted to have just a real close walk with the Lord. And even though he blew it, we talk about the sins of David. They were pretty big. He was still considered a man after God's own heart. So I, I tell you what, I, I read these Psalms. I love them. I love them. I love them. And I just want to be more like the psalmist. And David wrote a lot of them. Other people wrote different ones. But I want to be one who's in tune and in touch with God, to be in God's presence, to love him, to adore him, to serve him, and to worship him. So we're going to pray, and then we're going to close with one more song of worship. How's that sound?